Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee, DJ Envy had to step out, but one of my favorite people on the planet is here with us this morning. This brother, this brother drops books like Gucci Man and Wayne used to drop mixtapes. Like it's unbelievable. <laughs> He's got another book out, Entertaining Race, Performing Blackness in America. Michael Eric Dyson is here. How are you, my brother? <laughs> Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, I apologize. Happy no, belated please. birthday, too. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. No, it's always great to be here with y'all. And I was listening to one of your recent conversations with T.S. Madison, man. It was mind-blowing and expanding. Only on The Breakfast Club can you get some of that real information. Well, when you, know? you tell me that you're learning something, I need to know what did you learn from that conversation? What did you take from it? Well, you know, it's the utter humanity of people, no matter what their sexual orientation uh, what their understanding of sex is, what their understanding of gender or race is. And to have an open conversation about it, for her to be as sincere, I think that's her pronoun, right? Mm -hmm. her, for her to be as open and straightforward and irreverent and as joyful, as jolly, and as self-critical and, you know, telling the truth about what her experiences have been, what she likes and doesn't like, and how it informs her, it's something we need to hear because, you know, obviously trans identity in the news uh, recently because of my dear brother Dave Chappelle's engagement with the issue, uh, you know, has come to the fore. And I think, look, black people, at least me as a black intellectual, I've been used to white folks saying all kind of crazy stuff or thinking all kind of crazy things. And you could either cancel them, cut them off, tell mm -hmm. them to go to hell, or you could try to explain it. You schooled me on that. Uh, I mean, yeah. right? You you could try to explain it and talk to him. Now, a lot of I know a lot of younger black people. I was uh, uh, engaging in conversation uh, with uh, Michael Denzel Smith. Is it? Yeah, Michael Denzel Smith. And he said, "I was first mad at your book, um, Tears We Cannot Stop: A Sermon of Black uh, White America, because you were kind of explaining stuff to white folk." as opposed to writing to us, and I was used to you writing to us, and I said, look, and I love that brother, man. He's one of the greatest young writers in America, and I said, look, man, I said, I, I done wrote 24, well, by that time, I think it was 22 books. I got 24 and 28, so I'm trying to write books like Negroes write hooks. So I do what I do, but I said, I've written enough and a lot, uh, not enough in terms of it's enough and let it go. I've written a whole bunch for black people, and I will continue to do so. But I said, it's my obligation to also talk to white people and those others as well. That's right. So that, you know, and I joke, I was at uh, in my class one day and the students were like mad, like, we didn't come here to teach white people. We are here for our own education, which is a healthy uh, gesture in the midst of uh, an academic culture where black kids got to do all they work and... On top of that, educate uh, ignorant people who are uninterested or unintelligent or willfully ignorant about what they're doing. So I was joking with him. I said, yeah, I didn't come to the school to teach white people. I, I said, oh, well, well, actually, I did. I, I am a professor. I, that's what I do. I mm -hmm. teach white, black, Latino, Asian, you know, indigenous, whoever. And I think that at some point, the argument about Dave Chappelle has to go through if you got an argument against what he's saying, that's perfect and beautiful. But make the argument. Don't kill what he's saying, because if he thinks that way, maybe a bunch of people think that that's way. Right. In my class, I used to go, if you think that way and you've got a question you think is ignorant and you won't tell nobody, then maybe a lot of people have these kinds of questions. Plus, how do we dismiss him out of hand? Because a lot of people are thinking, right? I'm sitting, you know, I was sitting here listening to your conversation with T.S. about, you know, her having breasts and also fully equipped with what God gave her at birth. She's seeing that as the kind of lifeline mm -hmm. to the divine. So that's a complicated, nuanced perspective about what sexual orientation is, about what gender is. So if Dave Chappelle or if J.K. Rowling or if uh, Shimamanda Adichie are wondering about how do we talk about feminism with trans women who come into the game, it doesn't mean you want to rule them out. Right. I've, look, I've been on record. I preached sermons in black churches against homophobia when it wasn't a thing. I wrote a book about black women and loving them when it wasn't a thing. Right. W why I love black women. It wasn't no black uh, girl magic and no black boy joy. Mm -hmm. That was something long ago because I thought it was extremely necessary for us to address issues of gender, issues of oppression, issues of sexuality. 
And the trans issue is extremely valuable because it makes all of us nervous. And what am I dealing with? Damn, I mean, what, what, you, what, what you is? It was deep enough when people, like they said, bisexual, that gay people and straight people were both mad at him. Make up your damn mind. What team you playing for? Mm -hmm. Well, trans raises it to another level. Let me tell you that your very binary notions of either or are a deficit thinking and a problematic way of thinking about it. But if that's true, if binaries are the problem that trans identities underscore, then let's not have an either or. Either you're in or you're out. Your point about accountability or cancel. Damn, can we do something more? Can That's we right. say, I'm ignorant. When I see uh, women say, you've been a man for 25 years. You've been a white man for 25 years. You make the critical, crucial, world-changing decision uh, to shift the gender paradigm and to assume an identity that doesn't fall into binaristic either or. Can I have a question? What does that mean? Can I interrogate that experience? Can I do an informal ethnography? Can I question? Can I ask? Can you inform me? Can you instruct me? And so I had heard all the stuff about Dave Chappelle. I was like, damn, what did he do? And I looked at it and I said, look, when, when Dave Chappelle is talking about something that I think we haven't underscored here, that he's saying that what do you call a black transgender person? Nigger, he said. Now, the thing is, is that Malcolm X says, what do you call a black man with a PhD? Nigger. Nigger. So James Baldwin said the problem that black people had with Jews, Jewish brothers and sisters, is not that they're Jewish, it's that they're white. So can we not entertain a notion that for white trans human beings, that their whiteness supplies a psychic folklore a kind of psychological support, an existential investment in a whiteness that itself can trump the supposed identification with the other that your trans identity brings to the fore. And we got to be able to have an atmosphere where we can raise intelligent, intelligible questions without being read out of the race or the gender or of our humanity. Because we ain't talking about no right-wing fundamentalist assault upon the integrity of identity. We're talking about raising serious questions. And this is, again, where the cancel culture and the harsh repudiation of anybody who thinks differently mm -hmm. or tries to raise questions that are full of integrity. I mean, to cancel Dave Chappelle one of the greatest geniuses we've seen in comedy because you disagree with him. Boy, if I had the right to do that for people I disagree with, it would be deep. But what did I have to do? <laughs> Read. I had to study. I had right. to make arguments. Oh, you coming with that? Cool. Let me tell you what I got to say about this. So instead of trying to cancel the human being, because when you cancel the human being, you ain't canceling the issue. You just canceling that one identification. That's right. This is why cancel culture to me is ineffective. That's right. You're wiping out one person. You're not wiping out a way of thinking, That's right. a worldview. So I don't know. I was informed by all of that. And that's trying, what I'm trying to do in this book, too, right. is to have a more complicated and nuanced perspective about what it means to be black, about what it means to entertain the idea of race, because the, the title there is entertaining race. So I'm trying to entertain the ideal of race. I'm trying to talk about how black people have been entertainment for white folk from the get go. I opened the book with a um, story of a young black girl who was being enslaved. Right. She was being, you know, brought from Africa uh, onto the ship and then from the ship into the New World. And she's a 15-year-old girl. She had been infected, ironically enough, by the physician on the ship with a venereal disease. She's 15. They used to do what they call on the slave ships, dance the slaves. That means you got to keep them up. You got to get them up and get them, you know, exercising so they won't, you know, grow weary along the way. And it's Keep also it. entertainment. And it's entertainment for them, you know, for the white men mostly or non-black men who are on the ship. And it's a way of bringing, you know, a relief to the tedium of the journey. So this girl one day, you know, because of venereal disease, I mean, you know, obviously we ain't got no deep medicine two, three centuries ago. And she's feeling horrible and she doesn't want to get up. And so uh, the, the slave master... At that point, the, the captain of the ship grabbed her, Captain Kimber, and then hung her upside down by one ankle, nude mostly except a little thin cloth, lawn cloth on her, um, you know, in her midsection, and then whipped her and beat her to death. And why? What was the reason? Because she refused to perform. So I see that wow. as a metaphor for what we have had to do in this country that black people, from the very beginning, black people have been asked, demanded, mandated that we perform, and not just in terms of sports or 
entertainment, but everyday lives. We got to perform for white brothers and sisters in corporate America on street corners, on people who are asking us questions about mm-hmm. who we are. So I wanted to look at that across the board and then bring all that stuff together. What, what do you think about, because um, everything you're saying, of course, is true, but it's just mm-hmm. like, you know, a lot of people, when they see entertainers, right. the first thing they say is, oh, you dancing for the white man. Or, oh, you a corporate sellout. Do you think that's generational trauma because of what we experienced? What they Like that woman getting beat right, right. made everybody look at that person. Oh, she must, that person must be dancing. In right. order to be achieving in that entertainment f- space. No, it's a great point, and it's true. There is a kind of epigenetic uh, element to that where we've inherited the trauma biologically and reproduced it unconsciously as disdain for anybody who does that. At the same time, right, and we got and we got legitimate reason for some who actually do, right? If you if you the you know the Negro, the coon who's shuffling and jiving for white people and deferring to their interests without having a kind of double face, because all black people had to face it. The thing is, we go, ha, ha, yeah, master, right, right, right. Then we pee in the greens, right? <laughs> or, or then, or then it's a, he said, boy, them greens sure do taste good today. Yeah, gave some extra for you today. Don't worry about it. <laughs> or we broke the, the tools that we were supposed to hold the ground with. We broke them, right? Or we broke the legs of the animals that were supposed to be helping us. I mean, or, or we aborted babies, right? So when you have a kind of fascistic fundamentalism that tutors you against abortion, remember that abortion on the slave quarter was to interrupt the forces of white supremacy and capitalism and say, I'm going to undercut your ability to reproduce my children so you could own them. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my God and be free. So, yeah, some of that is operating. But what it misses is the fact that we were we were entertaining ourselves, too. Right. While we were doing it for, quote, the white man, we were generating spaces uh, of joy and celebration where we could love each other, where we could attend to each other, where we could treat each other with joy. And the, 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 the racist element, of course, is to assume every Negro is an entertainer. Every mm-hmm. Negro can dance and sing. We know that ain't true because it denies the legitimacy of who we are. If you think black people inherit a gene of entertainment, you ain't going to appreciate what Beyonce doing. You ain't going to appreciate what Michael Jackson is doing. They had to study. They had to think. They had to practice. They had to rehearse. And they had a gift that God gave them, and they developed that. That ain't with everybody who's black. So if you think everybody, oh, black people can naturally have enough rhythm to do that, you missing out on what it took Usher or Chris Brown uh, to come up with and to do, or Catherine Dunham, or, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that part of the ancestry is is somehow undercut when we think every act of performance in white spaces is meant to titillate and therefore entertain white people to the exclusion of our own black agency being expressed. You also talk about entertainment when it comes to sports, right? Mm-hmm. And then how they really pitted Colin Kaepernick versus Jay-Z right, right. with everything that's going on with the NFL. Right, so can right. you talk about that? Yeah, I think that's unfortunate because, look, Colin Kaepernick is a heroic figure by any measure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what he's done to really raise the issue in a way uh, as an ideal symbol to articulate black resistance to social distress. You know, um, he talked to Nate Boyer, as who was a veteran um, and a guy in the NFL who said, look, Instead of sitting down on the bench, because that's what Colin was doing at first, he said, why don't you take a knee? That would show reverence, as you all know, for the flag and for American culture, even as you were protesting. He did that, and it still wasn't good enough, because, you know, white folk can't tell you how to protest them. And if they do, it's not going to be the most effective protest, right? As Jesse Jackson says, you can't go to Pharaoh, you can't go to Freedom School on Pharaoh's scholarship. You got to figure out a way to generate your own sense of protest. Martin Luther King Jr. understood that. You're not going to do things that make white people comfortable. You're trying to make them uncomfortable. Right. And the discomfort itself is a measure and an index of the distance between white practice and black belief. So, yeah, Colin Kaepernick was extraordinary. But Jay-Z, a genius, right, just got um, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the first hip-hop artist to be inducted uh, into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. That's another way. That's another route. There's more than one way to get to Broadway or 75th close, go down 72nd, go up to 63rd. So the point is that Jay-Z's way is, look, I've been a hustler. I've been uh, a a person who stood on street corners and engaged in nefarious activity that undercut my my culture. 
You know, he talked about you had to learn to live with regrets on his first album. I'm Marcy's son, that's where I'm from. I'm from the place where the churches are the flakiest. Because been praying to God, praying to God so, so long, long that, that they atheists. atheists. Wow, what does that mean? That means your prayers ain't getting answered with God you're praying to. That means your divinity may be distorted by the negative inferences that you've accumulated unconsciously in your mind and perpetuated as a legacy of your fundamentalist belief. Damn, he said all that? Yeah. Is that's Mike right. Dyson making it up? No. no. Respect the God's intelligence and in what he does. So the point is... When you got the president... Talking about how he was quoting Jay Z on his campaign trail. I mean, like, brush on, the man. dirt off your shoulders, huh? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Re all respect and uh, apologies to Hillary Clinton. So the point is, for some who uh, took that the wrong way. So the point is, Jay Z got a different way. Now he's elevated himself uh, as a billionaire. Yeah. But even more important than that is the fact that he's a social justice advocate who understands the plight and predicament of black people. And unlike some other black people who have argued for social justice as artists, but never see it reflected in their art, he even reflected it in his art. You know, uh, Bin Laden been happening in Manhattan back then, back when the police was out kind of the black men. So the point is that he's been talking about that for a minute. God forgive me for my brash delivery, delivery. but I remember vividly, vividly what, what these streets, streets did, did to me. me. Imagine me allowing you to nitpick at me, portray me like a pickany. So the point is, pickaninny, but condensed for linguistic purposes as part of his <laughs> genius yeah. rhetorically. So the point is that 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 yeah, his way is a different way. And getting Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and Kendrick Lamar and Mary J. Blige, Mary J. Blige, Blige. Eminem. at the and Eminem at the halftime show. Don't don't sneeze at that. Don't sleep on that. Oh, that's capitalism's black face articulating a colonial uh, mindset. It could be that, but it could be something different too. Because Colin Kaepernick could also sign a, a contract with Nike. Right. Is he a sellout because he did that? Because he got to feed his family? No. So let's stop I watched this show on Netflix all weekend. I mean, I watch Colin on. show on Netflix. He's Netflix. Is he's Netflix. front and center starring in the show. Like. Right. That must be a hood thing. Right. Netflix. Oh, no. It's part of capitalism. <laughs> oh, no. It's part of the system. My point is you can use your computer to undermine Xerox. Right. Or, or Apple or whatever. You know, I know that Audre Lorde, the great late uh, uh, theorists and uh, feminists said, you can't use the master's tools to un un dismantle the master's house. Sometimes I think you got to use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. So yes, Jay-Z and Colin Kaepernick, not either or. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm glad they inducted LL Cool J too. Show some Word love up. to my man. I mean, one of the greats, Doc. And, and, and There's no get, J without an LL. I mean, without, uh, you know, I can't live without my radio. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, darn. Uh, uh, my God. You know, mama... Mama said, knock you out. I mean, I'm bad. I'm, I mean, Jesus, man, the Panther. So, and then love for the ladies. How about that? Mm -hmm. in, 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 in the midst of misogyny, noir and misogyny unleashed, he's talking about loving and embracing. Right. Don't call it a comeback. I've been here for, for years. years. I man, need come love. On. I mean, come I on. I think LL come was the on. first. Love, um, I think he was the first rapper that had commercial success, being he could be street and. The ladies loved him at the same time. He at showed the, that balance way before a lot of guys did. I mean, he could whip that belt buckle and women went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> or he could pull it off and <laughs> lash up against people who were trying to diss him as men. So you're right. That kind of uh, bivocal, bi you know, bivocabulary, like both and, not either or. And to show that you could be soft, soft and sensitive, I need love. That's, that's the first hip-hop joint that's about love at that level, un, unequivocally uh, expressing love and affection for women. I mean, hip hop got deep into the misogyny, the hatred of women, the sexism, the sentiments against women, the patriarchy, the uncritical belief that men's lives determine the pattern and paradigm for expressing uh, our relationship to the world. And he was undercutting that. So thank God for that brother right there getting his recognition. You know, I, I, I definitely want to talk about performing blackness in yeah. America, but I, I do want to talk about what you just said, because if you don't get Jay-Z mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. or Snoop Dogg then, right. you can't appreciate where they are now. Right. And, and if we keep canceling people instead of looking at the whole totality of men, the same way we looked at the whole totality of a Malcolm X, same way we can look at the whole totality of a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., how are we going to educate people and let people know that growth and evolution is a real thing? I, I am so with you on that. I, I I cannot express enough. All of us have made mistakes. I know I've made mine. I don't know about y'all. Definitely. But it's not my mother, not my father, but it's me, oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. That's why I got two sermons in this book. People go, you a preacher, too? I, I know my 
uh, mm-hmm. life might indicate uh, otherwise. But yeah, I <laughs> is a preacher. And am I conscious of the mistakes I've made? Absolutely right. But let me tell you what, we don't even have a culture. Our culture is so toxic and antithetical to the acknowledgement of our frailty and failure that we can't afford to confess anymore. Because if we confess, it's to, see what I tell you, he's wrong. See, I told you that about Charlemagne. I told you about Angela Yee. I told you about DJ Envy. I told you, wait a minute, you ain't got to tell me. I know myself. But are, do we have the space to be able to apologize? Let me give one quick example. So, for instance, um, Governor Northam, Ralph Northam, over in Virginia, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Got caught black back face. in the day, blackface, right? Uh, 20-some years ago, though. Oh, it wasn't yesterday. It was 20 years. Now, I'm not saying, say, even 20 years ago, you a doctor. What were you doing? Going into the surgery room <laughs> with the blackface on? do da do da It was kind of <laughs> whack. It was crazy. <laughs> You right, and that's not what we meant when we said we wanted to have black faces in high places, bro. You misinterpreted. Word, word, we appreciate word. your appreciation <laughs> for blackface, but we don't need it to be yours. Having said that, Pharrell, my man, called me up. He's from Virginia. He said, "Doc, I got some politicians who want to speak to you who are black, wondering what we should do. Should we try to ride this man out of office?" I met with them and I said, "Hell to the no!" To quote the late great Whitney Houston, I said, "Ain't nothing better than a white guy who has been forgiven into greater grace." So that that white person can perform um, vicariously and with some measure of integrity, a kind of black, you know, a black promotion, a black advocacy and advocacy for justice that otherwise might not be the case. I said, this dude could turn out to be Abraham Lincoln. You don't know. That's what right. did he do? First thing he did when they forgave him, he stayed in the office. He uh, freed 10,000 felons, right? You know wow. a disproportionate number of those are black in terms of having their voting rights restored. He went on to deal with black health care and other issues of concern to black people. The point is that instead of canceling him and embracing him, forgiving him into a greater destiny, this man was able to extend the trajectory of our concerns about social justice in a way that had he been erased, the next guy wouldn't have even been concerned about. Because you'd ask the next guy, hey, did you do blackface? Well, actually, the next guy in line did. But beyond that, right, the next white guy, he said, you, we could say, hey, have you done blackface? No. Have you done anything called black people? Uh, the N-word? No. Uh, okay, great. Are you concerned about black people's interests? Mm, no, no, not at all. <laughs> so the point is, let's use the, the strategic advantages we've gained as a result of people's flaws and then transform them into something that can be potentially redemptive. But when your point is vengeance, and I'm sorry, many of the social justice movements from Me Too to, to anti-blackness in this country are, are getting gorged on vengeance as a poor substitute for justice. Because Dr. King, in quoting another saying, Lex Talionis, right, an eye for an eye, he said, if you do eye for an eye, everybody going to be blind. That's right. So if you cancel everybody, who's left to, to cancel and uncancel? That's right. Where to cancel? You to cancel Lee today, you're going to be the canceler tomorrow. You to canceler today, you're going to be the canceler tomorrow. That's right. So my point is redemption and forgiveness. Now, I say all that to say Ralph Northam initially was coming out, yeah, yeah, I, I was trying to be Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. I was trying to do Michael. But then when they was look like, oh, we about to put your butt out. Uh, I have no idea what that was. That wasn't me. Then he got the shaggy defense. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> huh? Then he got the Scooby Doo. Huh? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> so you forcing people to lie and be disingenuous because there is no space for forgiveness That's or right. mercy. And I'm tired of all the self-righteous, judgmental, finger pointing social justice advocates who have no sense of the evolution and development of consciousness and the fact that, yeah, we might have messed up, but we fess up and dress up and we move forward. And for me, that doesn't mean we're not held to account. I was listening to T.S. when you were talking about that accountability, and she said, look, you got to show you've been accounted. That's true. That's that's great. But all of us have evolved. When I hear people toss around cishet, what the hell? You didn't know what cishet meant three years ago. That's right. I don't know what it means now. <laughs> I, I, know, I know what cisgender is. Right, right, and heterosexual. Cis- oh, 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 cisgender, okay, heterosexual. Okay, got you, got you, got but you. But that's my point, though. You, use it, you toss around phrases like you making rap songs, and that's great, but acknowledge that 10 years ago you didn't know it. Three years ago you didn't know it. We all evolve. Let's lift as we climb, as Mary McLeod Bethune and the National Council of Negro Women said. And in order to do that, we've got to forgive people. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't trying to cancel Bull Connor. He's trying to cancel white supremacy. He's trying to get at the nefarious activity of a systemic inequity that needed to be challenged. And I think we need more of the love 
We need more of the compassion, and we need more of the understanding. Are there some people who should be canceled? Though? Well, of course. Okay. I mean, I mean, like who? Like, let's see. You know, the dude that had the trial recently. You know, that was uh, exploiting women through his music mm -hmm. and doing it. Now he was, but, but see, here's the thing. We know R. Kelly is a deeply troubled black man, mm -hmm. and we know he has to be held to account. But God forbid if we said. You know, he also was subject to some vicious practices that our community covered, too. Not just covering R. Kelly because of the genius of his music. Well, there's no doubt about his genius. I saw people saying, well, he ain't no genius. Stop. See, that's why you you illegitimate. That's why your even your argument against him can't be taken seriously because you can't even acknowledge the degree to which the ingenuity of his music was part of his charm and also part of his deceptive, irreverent exploitation and seduction as the Pied Piper. So because of his genius that was exploited wrongly, he ended up engaging in not only criminal activity, but some could call evil activity. No question about that. But there's also the argument that our community covered up the kind of sexual abuse to which he was subject. And can we imagine a scenario where after serving whatever time he does, that we can figure out a way to redeem and bring him back into the community, right? Because if we didn't, there would be no Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a petty thief by his own account in his own book. The stuff he did uh, the, the biographies that came out afterwards suggesting that when he was talking about a, uh, you know, a, one of his colleagues mm -hmm. servicing a white man in a same sexual relationship, arguments have been made that that was a projection and a collection of stories of many people, including Malcolm. Mm -hmm. So my point is... Either way, Malcolm, he was so evil that he called himself Satan. There it is. At least by his standards, he thought he was No so question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the point is, is that here's a guy who by those standards was dysfunctional, and incapable of being integrated into the larger circle of black America. And yet he became one of our greatest spokespeople ever. That's right. Now, look, when they unleashed those tapes on Dr. King 2027, trust and believe, Ooh. son, it ain't nothing nice. Ooh. It ain't nothing nice, son. And, and my point is, there are Ooh. a lot of people then, therefore, when they see that, going to try to cancel Dr. King. Are you kidding? They would, by the way, they would try to cancel Dr. King just based off what they know now. Like, if you just... Without question. <laughs> without question. Right. Now, I'm out here trying to do the right thing, <laughs> and these people are trying to cancel me, and I don't even have a subscription to Ebony. Yeah, I don't like to compare morals. I don't like I don't like to right. do that. I don't like to play moral Olympics. But Malcolm X was way more morally sound than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was. There's no question, but Dr. King was far more effective as a social That's justice right. advocate That's for right. black people That's right. because he was in touch with his own frailty and and lack of, you know, uh, moral turpitude, so to speak, than a Malcolm. Look, they're both great, but if we're going to compare, that kind of rigid judgmentalism that is cancel culture is Malcolm for the most of his life. Let's just be real, right? Because what are you doing in certain cultic or certain religious um, communities where the conservative values mitigate a kind of uh, social, you know, dissolution and a social debauchery? That's true. But at the same time, look how judgmental you are. Women got to be rigid and occupy their space. Men can't be gay because they occupy their space. Now, they are men who are gay within these religious institutions. But the religious fundamentalism uh, really di disallows the proliferation of difference. On the other hand, you got a Dr. King. Now, it's not that they weren't being judgmental. They were. Not that they were like, you know, they used to say, why can't Baptists, um, you know, have sex standing up because somebody will think they're dancing. So the point is, <laughs> so, so, so they, they y'all forgive me for that, but uh, it is what it is. So the judgmentalism, the judgmentalism on both communities is real. So, but Malcolm also chafed at the kind of narrow religious constraint when he saw the difference between himself and Elijah Muhammad and what was going on and the argument that in common they have made, have had affection for a particular young lady. So the point is, even when it looks on the surface like it's cleaned up mm -hmm. and gussied up, there are moral contradictions internally. So Malcolm X was a remarkable, major, fundamentally powerful uh, leader. In fact, what you said, the FBI said, uh, he ain't no Martin Luther King now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even mm -hmm. the FBI came to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. But having said that, if somebody put a tape recorder under your bed, what we going to discover? That's right. I saw you and Angela joking back and forth. That's what you said. No, that's what you said. Imagine we ain't got to joke about it because we got a tape recorder under your bed. And no matter what you say, we got the tapes. So, so Martin Luther King Jr. has his wife sent 
by the FBI That's right. to his wife, tapes of his indiscretions oh. and her having to stand up and say, that wasn't my husband outside, but on the inside knowing what it was. But here's the thing. And then he even got to the point where she said, go ahead, y'all do what y'all want because this movement bigger than my marriage. I mean, she understood that. Now, we're not trying to say every woman should do that. We're not trying to suggest that duplicitous relations and the, the kind of um, moral disrespect or disloyalty that s- certain black men have shown to black women or men have shown to women should be tolerated. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, however, is that to cancel Martin Luther King Jr. based upon narrow litmus tests of authentic morality in a narrow framework misses the broader way in which he shattered the manacles and the shackles that we all have. Now, in 2027, when it comes out that Martin Luther King Jr. and a famous gospel singer had a white woman prostitute come to the room and Mm -hmm. then both engaged in relationships. Now, that's already on the record. Mm -hmm. I'm saying there's other stuff. And I'm saying in my two books about Martin Luther King Jr., I wrote he's the greatest American we've ever had. Now, black people were pissed at me because I dealt with some of the indiscretions, the marital indiscretion and the stuff about him cheating in terms of uh, plagiarizing. They're both true. We can't lie about that because they're public record. I'm not trying to expose Dr. King. I'm trying to say let's deal honestly and straightforwardly with what the flaws are that he mm-hmm. possessed and still not cancel him. Because without him, we wouldn't have the right to talk about cancel. That's right. Without Martin Luther King Jr., none of us would do what we do or could do what we do. I'm not reducing the complexity of movement to Martin Luther King Jr., but name anybody. Ella Baker, Joanne Robinson, Septima Clark, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Ain't nobody perfect. Humans will always fail purity tests. Ain't no doubt about it. And the purity test you have for somebody else, you will fall into. The Bible says be careful about the grave you dig because somebody you could fall in it yourself. The grave you dig for somebody else could be your own. So the purity test you got for somebody else, you're going to fail. And often people are more aggressive about purity tests the, the more aware they are of their own impurity. And my point is, it's not to suggest that because of that, because of the recognition that we're all impure, therefore anything goes. That's not my point. My point is, can we have an understanding of the com- complicated, nuanced perspective if God can forgive us, my right. God, what do we need to do for each other? So when that stuff on King comes out, I've already in my two books said he's imperfect. And as I tell black people the reason I dealt with that, first of all, because you're always mad at white people when they say, well, you're trying to make Thomas Jefferson look like he was great, but you don't want to talk about his owning slaves. So here I am talking about the stuff that is unsavory. Now you're mad at me for doing that. But mm-hmm. I thought you were mad at the white people mm-hmm. for trying to hold up their leaders to an impossible standard. So I talk about it, A, because it happened, mm-hmm. B, because it's true, but C, because I can then integrate that into, into a calculus of my determination that despite the flaws and the failures and the foibles, this man, before he was 30 year, 39 years old, before he turned 40, so fundamentally changed the world with the help of a battalion of of everyday saints, of grassroots idols and figures who were of tremendous courage to do something that very few people have been able to do bloodlessly in this country in terms of transforming American practice and civil practices and civil rights and the like. So I'm saying that can we give Dr. King an understanding in that light and we don't have that sense of complexity. And if King were here today, on Twitter, they'd be jacking him up, canceling him. him. I mean, every day. I mean, just look, look at what he did. Look what he did. Give him the look same grace you give Joe Biden. Give him the same grace you give Bill Clinton. My give him the God, same grace. Can, he, can we get some of that? <laughs> can up. we get some of that recognition that, yeah, I done done some jacked up stuff, but I'm a human being and need to be understood. That's right. Mm, I yeah. want to talk about performative blackness because, you know, you said something earlier. You talked about how... You know, you wrote a book about loving black women, you know, way before it was a popular thing, right, you know. Right. Um, I do see a lot of performative blackness. Like, mm-hmm. I can remember some of these entertainers literally saying, I don't want to be black. Of course. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. And, and what do you think of that? Well, you take it where you can get it. And everybody everybody ain't going to be equal, right? We, everybody ain't going to be Angela Yee, Charlemagne, DJ Envy, right? And even we, we, you know. What day did you get saved? It was a Saturday night. <laughs> what, what day did you get? Well, it was Friday morning. How about you? It was Thursday. It wasn't nothing going on. It wasn't especially dramatic. I just woke up and right. right? So everybody got different story and testimony. And some people, here's the thing. You can perform yourself into genuine identity and identification. Mm-hmm. Right? You could like, like, why are you going to church? Man, I saw this fine ass woman. 
I mean, and then I got up there and discovered Jesus was there too. That's right. Yeah, 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 oh yeah, man, yeah, that, yeah. oh that's a great thing yeah. too. Jesus is the bonus <laughs> initially. Then he becomes your savior if that's what you believe. So my point is, is that performativity can often, right? You can. What did what did the great philosopher George Clinton say? Free your mind and your, your ass, ass will, will follow. follow. So, but sometimes your ass will lead you into spaces where your mind can be freed, right? So you can perform before you believe, <laughs> right? And you perform it like a little kid singing. Jesus will never, right? They sing it. They don't, you're four years old. You have no idea who Jesus <laughs> is, right? You're six years old, but thank God. So they're four years old and five years old and 10 years old and 12 years old. And then when they become aware, right, of who God is for them, Muhammad, reading the Tao Te Ching, the Ole Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, whatever it is, you have been integrated into a community of language and vocabulary that gives you a sense of who you are. I don't want to invoke Wittgenstein and Du Bois and hooks, but there are there are, and, and 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 you know Du Bois. There are, there are complicated ways in which people learn to perform what it is that they're about before they learn to appreciate what that is. So there are women who are singing, who are, you know, 10 years into the game because their heart got broken. Look at Mary J at the beginning. Look at Mary J 10 years in the game. Mm -hmm. Look at Aretha Franklin at the beginning. Look at Aretha Franklin when she's grappling with the, the, the demand for respect. So the point is, you know, I know performative is a word pejoratively deployed by younger people, and I get that, and I understand why. But don't tell me Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't performing. Right? Martin Luther, G Martin Luther King Jr. was performing. He said, let me see. If we can figure out a way to get Bull Connor to open them water hoses and those police dogs on black folk when they're watching right. this stuff at dinner time on the news, mm -hmm. white people are going to be like, what, Jiminy right. Cricket, what in the hell? <laughs> That's performance. John Lewis going across provoking the cops to engage in nefarious activity. And I know there are complicated, nuanced, ethical arguments about the way in which violence is both about the pursuit of the response that you want to expose violence's origins. I get all that. But at the end of the day, they were performing. Now, that's different than performative. Like, yes, I love you and I want to do the right thing. Let me put a black box on Instagram. But when you come to my corporate America, I'm keeping the dough all for myself. No. Nah. That's performative in the pejorative negative meaning. But even there, if black people talk about blackness now the way they weren't then, maybe they got maybe they got saved. Maybe they got an awareness. Maybe because it's the popular thing to do, they got involved with it on the ground level, but then they began to understand something deeper and more refreshing. And I have to say that because I'm a teacher. You know, I, I, I grade my students. Well, I ain't graded students for 20 years. I let my TA do that. But I argue that the grades you get ain't about whether or not you did well on every test. It's about your growth. It's about the arc. It's about the trajectory. You are much more open-minded at the end than you were at the beginning. You're writing with greater ease and efficacy at the end than you did the beginning. I weigh the positive against the journey of the negative toward what you are meant to be. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, uh, we have to do that. So the performative is pejorative, and I understand it, and all of us get tired of it. But at the same time, you got to allow people to come at their own pace and space in the race so that they can attend and achieve the grace. I didn't mean to do the Jesse Jackson <laughs> and the rhyme scheme there. But the point is that you got to be open enough to understand that people get it differently. Get it how you get it. And when you get it how you get it and you come to an awareness and, oh, that aha moment comes differently for all of us. Yes, we must be critical of the mere public performance of a particular ideal that we privately repudiate and undercut. Let's talk about that. But at the same time, let's have enough grace to say people come at it in different ways. You, you have uh, essays in the book about Nas's One Love, a song mm -hmm. that we don't talk about enough. Why, why was that song so important? Well, it was, you talking about personal and existential, it was important oh, yeah. to me because my brother, God rest his soul, Everett Dyson Bay, died nearly two years ago. I miss him every day, spent more than half his life in prison for a crime we believe he did not commit, of murder. But he was convicted by an all-black jury. When they say black people don't send black people to jail, bull feathers. And, um, and that meant something to me because I would write him letters, he would write me letters, we would exchange sentiments. Highly intelligent young man. In fact, when Soul Dad O'Brien did the first Black in America, ours was one of the stories. 
So they got one brother I was then teaching at the University of Pennsylvania at Penn and another brother in the Penn. So we talked about that that polarity. We talked about that bifurcation. We talked about that division and that contradiction, but also what joined us together, what brought us together, what bonded us as brothers. So when I heard that one love uh, by Nas with the the great jazz uh, score provided um, by the Heath brothers and in their genius and produced by uh, Q-Tip, it was an extraordinary song and I wrote about it because it touched me on a personal level. And speaking of another genius uh, in Nasir Jones, and, and what I love about Nasir Jones and Jay-Z and, and LL Cool J, you know, here they are. They're like the Tom Brady and the LeBron. You know, they're out here doing it, you know, 20 years in the game, That's 25 right. years in the game. Like you with these books. Well, I, I'm mm-hmm. trying to do what I do. You know, dropping the knowledge, making it possible, and making relevant rap records, not some oldie but goodie stuff. But making relevant rap records now uh, that make a difference. So that song touched me in a fundamentally uh, determinative way. How did it feel when Jay asked you to, you know, personally be one of the voices inducting him into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Yeah, that was uh, that's a tremendous, uh, tremendous gift, man. I mean, you know, you're talking about uh, again when we talk about a Jay or a Nas or even an LL at that matter. You know, the rhetorical sophistication. But when you're talking about a Jay Z. And Anaz, in terms of their their verbal command, and in Jay's case, you ain't even writing it down. I mean, if you look at the specificity of his metaphoricity, and that's a big. If you look at the specific way in which his metaphors, his analogies, his similes, the way in which his you know uh, poetic devices that are being used in big time poets, and then we don't want to give him credit. Oh, he's, he's some rapper. He don't even know what he's doing. He's, he's lucky. He doesn't have technical proficiency. He just guessed himself into that. Stop. Stop it. This, this is Shakespearean level of creation. This is Homer. Homer could neither read nor write. But nobody's going to call him illiterate. Jay-Z and, and, and Biggie, for that matter, not writing it down. And in Jay's case, because... You know, he's hustling on the streets. So, okay, first day, I got to remember this line. Let me remember this line. Then as you're on the street, because I'm hustling, I can't, you know, sit down and write stuff because I'm trying to sell crack. I learned to put it into pockets of my memory, he said. And so eventually he begins to do it with a, with a word, then with a sentence, then with a verse, then with a song. So that necessity is the mother of invention, in his case, meant that there was some rhetorical fluidity that he was able to deploy a, as a means of, for a mnemonic device, How can I use this to learn stuff and memorize stuff? So when you talk about that level of genius that he deploys and the way in which he's able to speak about the full range of our experiences, whether partying or politics, uh, it's extraordinary. And to have developed a a, a friendship with him, a a meaningful and significant one is is pretty cool. And then to be asked to participate along with Kendrick Lamar and... uh, Missy Elliott, I'm trying to represent for the for the for the for the old heads and for the intellectuals. <laughs> hey, I ain't no rapper. I got bars, but I pass them every time because I'm not an alcoholic. So the point is, all right, I, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to do what I do. <laughs> but the point is, oh, oh yeah, I was whack, but I'm a whack rapper. But the point is that 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 I'm out here as an intellectual. My next book is going to be about my big book of hip hop. All the interviews over the years that I've, with Jay, with Nas, with Nipsey Hussle, with uh, with uh, uh, with um, MC Light and a whole bunch of others, man. J. Cole and so on. All of them, you know, J. Cole, uh, Lupe, J., uh, and Common all called into my class and gave me an hour in the class talking to my students. Just beautiful. So it's it's. When's that rewarding. book coming out? December. <laughs> a few months after that, uh, because next May I have a book coming out called Unequal that I've written with Mark Favreau. I'm gonna come back on here and bring him in Please. here. A white guy, black guy. We get together to write for teens. This is my first book for teens to think seriously and critically about these issues. So we'll be back on with y'all's blessing uh, then. That that comes out in May. So my hip hop book will probably come out in September. You got to come do my talk talk show too, man. Man, I'm trying to to get on there, man. Do you know the producer? Do you know the producer? (laughs) (laughs) I need need to get on, man. (laughs) I need to get on. But but yeah, so hip hop has been so fundamentally uh, a part of my own trajectory known as a hip hop intellectual uh, in U.S. News and World Reports back in the 90s. So I feel that I've seen it come full, you know, f- the full force of hip-hop come full circle. And to see a Jay-Z or a Nas or an LL Cool J 
uh, recognized and their genius uh, recognized or Lauren Hill recognized. It's uh, very gratifying. But in particular, for Jay-Z to uh, have invited me to be in the, into that cipher it is a beautiful thing. But before we get out of here, I got to talk about the debate with Jordan Peterson. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's a uh, Canadian psychologist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's got a lot of different, you know, ideas and ideologies right. about gender and politics and culture war. Right, right, and, right. And I, he likes to say, I guess, certain people are politically correct because they go along with right, right, everything. Right. right, yeah. No, I had a debate with him. Uh, me and Michelle Goldberg went to, uh, uh, to Toronto. We went on his turf. And they're never scared. Where you want to go? Where you want to debate? It ain't in Harlem. It's in the University of Toronto, his home turf. And Stephen Fry, the actor and uh, comedic uh, actor and uh, also writer of, of, of tremendous note. So me and Michelle Goldberg, who is a, um, a columnist for The New York Times, were invited um, in a set of lectures over there uh, to, to debate. And we debated political correctness. And so me and, uh, me and Jordan Peterson got into it because I've, I've seen him get a pass on so many levels talking about stuff. You don't really, like, like, I don't understand what you mean by, well, he talks about this is the postmodern, by which he meant there are no standards, there are no ethical uh, precepts that bind us together as a community. I'm like, I teach postmodernity. You talking about Derrida, Jacques Derrida with deconstruction? You talking about Michel Foucault, the insurrection of subjugated knowledges? Are you talking about critical theory, Max Horkheimer? who said that the word critical, by the way, in critical race theory, because they derive it from there as well, Max Horkheimer, part of the Frankfurt School, uh, Jewish brothers and sisters, many of whom sought uh, through exile citizenship here in the United States of America, Herbert Marcuse, the teacher of Angela Davis, part of the Frankfurt School. But, but he said, that is Max Horkheimer, that the word critical in critical theory meant that anything that leads to the liberation of, from the circumstances that enslave human beings. That's all he meant by the word critical. And then you got people like Antonio Gramsci, uh, who's an Italian social theorist, the prison notebooks. Just go read that stuff. So the point is that he's talking about postmodernity. I'm talking about, but what you talking about? I teach it every day, bruh. So you're misusing the term, bewitching people and, and in some cases bewildering them, making them think seductively that you're in uh, command of a whole body of knowledge that you really ain't. I ain't trying to say he's the uh, whiz behind the curtain, but I'm saying I think you're misusing some of these terms. So we went at it, and I ended up calling him a mean, a mean man, bad white, white man. That's what I said. I said, bruh. <laughs> You know, I mean, and I know, look, I knew that that was going to go over like a brick cloud, <laughs> especially in Toronto. But again, I will go wherever, whenever to debate whoever about anything that I believe in, which is why I'm so sick and tired of the cancel culture. Debate, talk, build Word. an argument, Word. come up with a counter evidence, counterfactual evidence, if you will, or at least an evidence that counters what you see in play. But don't just try to, well, Jordan Peterson must be canceled. But let's talk about his ideas. Maybe some of them are interesting. Maybe they're engaging. Maybe they're so powerful because they're so wrong, but they're so seductive that you've got to come up with an equally powerful argument to really commandeer uh, the, the, rhetorical the rhetorical influence that he may have uh, gathered and gained by virtue of your hard intellectual work. Now, some of it ain't about intellectual work. It's about the fact that conservative ideals will always go over more powerfully among certain constituencies because some of them are reductive and flatten the horizon of complication and nuance. I get that. But at the same time, you got to do your work on your side to make sure you're coming up with a serious argument, which is why I was willing to go there. I've debated Jordan Peterson. I've debated black nationalists. I've debated people who thought they were lefter than me. I mean, it's all up in the book. I'm going wherever, whenever to talk about these ideas because they're extremely important. And that's why I was uh, gratified to go there to Toronto to debate Jordan Peterson. Let me let me hold the book real quick. Yes, sir. Thank you. Michael Eric Dyson, Entertaining Race, Performing Blackness in America, available everywhere you buy books now. I mean, if you got Michael's other 27 <laughs> books, so 27, right? 23. 23. 23. Well, 23. if I counted the other two books I wrote, it would be 26, 27. You're right. I mean, yeah, that's 27. It. but who's counting? <laughs> I got kids to feed, please. Right. <laughs> and happy belated to Queen uh, Marcia, too, man. Thank you, sir. I appreciate absolutely, that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll pass that along. Michael Eric Dyson, always a pleasure. Thank it's you. It's the so Breakfast much. Club. Thank you. Thank y'all.